Shalom Chavrim, I'm Steve Benu. you're watching Israeli News Live, and uh, boy, we talking about some very interesting things going on in the world today. I'm going to actually address in just a few moments here, uh, this particular article right here, the Jews aren't to blame for Jesus' death, a biblical, a Bible scholar asserts, that is, uh, Professor Israel Cole, and uh, we're going to be talking about that today here on Israeli News Live. This is an article that was sent to me by Adam Green. Uh, I want to thank Adam for bringing this to my attention. And I will tell you, it is the in-depth writing of this article really requires a scholastic response. And uh, I have been really studying a lot uh, to prepare for this. I am not fully prepared. Uh, to to speak on the subject, or, or let me put it this way here. I am prepared to speak on this subject and refute many of the claims that Mr. Israel Cole has, uh, Professor Israel Cole has in this argument here, uh, but there's still far more information that needs to be addressed as well. So I have been studying the historical side of Israel, uh, the people of Israel, the Israelites, and what they believe prior to the coming of Yeshua, uh, and uh, also his many of his assertions, which we're going to get into in just a moment there. Uh, just real quick, though, because there's a lot of things happening in the news uh, as well, so I'll just quickly touch on a couple of issues here. Damascus says it's ready to welcome the Kurds back under its protection, and as we mentioned to you in our broadcast yesterday, the intelligence sources that I was getting coming out of the Middle East there is that the Kurdish, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Syrian army has already moved some of its forces inside of the area with the Kurds, as well as some uh, uh, missile defense shields they have been putting over there as well. Uh, nonetheless, though, the Turks have already been attacking, uh, as we were speaking about that last night, uh, well, about 2 o'clock this morning, uh, we were speaking about this very issue there from the intelligence sources that we were getting, and that also you could anticipate that Israel would also launch attacks uh, on the Kurdish-held uh, areas there where ISIS militants are being held so that those ISIS militants could be freed. Now, I know that's hard for some people to believe. They think, oh, wow, Israel would never do something like that. Uh, well, unfortunately, Israel would, uh, as we have shared with you many times here on Israeli News Live before uh, one friend that I had, that I had dinner with him and his family uh, on, on an occasion in Israel there back a few years back, said to me that he knew of other soldiers that were speaking about how that ISIS militants were wearing tzitzit. Uh, that's the four corners of the Jew Jewish garb that you see uh, many Orthodox Jews wearing there, where they wear the, the, the tassels on the side of their garment, and this was being seen on ISIS militants. Uh, we also reported a little while back about uh, Baghdadi and how he would actually come out uh, that was through a same intelligence source said that he was going to come out and do a public statement about the role of ISIS in Libya. We reported that probably about a month before it ever happened, and it did take place. So we get some very valid intelligence information coming out, uh, and we try to share that information with you guys here on Israeli News Live. Uh, Trump is also vowing to stand by the Kurds and appeases Turkey ahead of Ankara's offensive in Syria. That's kind of an awkward situation the president has put himself into. And as I said to you already, uh, the intelligence that we were getting the other day really let us know uh, that President Trump is playing the, the hand of his puppet masters and what they tell him to do. And I, I do appreciate there's a lot of people that believe that President Trump was put into office to drain the, uh, the swamp. Uh, there's one man that has sent me uh, some information, wants me to listen to it. I will listen to this here. Uh, a video there that shows that, uh, well, Trump basically has been an infiltrator into this uh, conglomerate of political uh, nightmare there uh, to expose all those uh, deep state operatives that are inside both Democrat and Republican parties there. Uh, I would really like to believe that to be so. I really would. Uh, but unfortunately, as I have watched how the administration has gone, it didn't seem like anything about draining the swamp, only adding more uh, uh, roaches to the swamp, you might say, uh, or maybe we should say alligators to the swamp. So, you know, I, I just don't see that happening. And from the information that I have, uh, I, I definitely know that that I, I just don't see any possibility of that. I know there's a lot of excitement though uh, people especially in the Christian community that support President Trump people don't want to believe that there could be anything else but President Trump to be a savior to the world 
And uh, I, I only wish, as one person put in the comments in the video the other day, I only wished uh, that we would see uh, this type of love for Jesus Christ, for Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah himself. If we have that type of enthusiasm about Jesus Christ, as many Christians do about President Trump, uh, we could see some mighty uh, exploits of God taking place in the day that we're living in. Uh, so, but anyway, you know, I, I, I'm just alarmed at what I'm seeing going on right now uh, and some of the things that are being said. And, you know, the, and, and like I said, there's all this talk about impeachment of the president, things like that. Uh, again, I didn't say that I was for impeachment of the president. Uh, I think that, you know, this stuff needs to play its course out. People go to the polls. People can make the decision of, of who they want uh, to be in power. And, uh, and, and I certainly am not in favor of Democrats getting into power either. But, you know, I, I hear a lot of people say, you know, well, Steve, you know, you got to choose the worse, uh, the better of the two evils. And then I think to myself, as my wife said to me, if Jesus was here, which evil do you think he would choose? That puts it pretty much in perspective, doesn't it? Anyway, let's just think about it like that. Any, let's, let's get down to business, though. This, is a, this article right here is by uh, Professor Israel Cole, the man seen here in the uh, picture here. His family, uh, he is an, uh, his family were immigrants to Israel back in the 1930s. Uh, they also formed a kibbutz in Israel there, so he's been a long time there. He lives down uh, in the German colony there, and uh, he's, he's written a number of notable articles over the years in, in his research there, but he's really focused a lot on who Jesus is. Uh, and of course, in this latest article, the Jews aren't to blame for Jesus' death, a Bible scholar asserts. And of course, if Professor Israel Call is right, History books will require rewriting and church sermons around the world will have to be rethought. So, let me go ahead and assure the pastors that may have read uh, this, this dissertation or this article here, uh, which includes a lot of the dissertations by Professor Israel Cole, uh, you don't have to worry about throwing out the, uh, the, the sermons that you've preached before. Although, if you don't have a little bit of knowledge to be able to know where uh, Professor Israel Cole is coming from, uh, you could easily be rocked right into the wrong direction because Professor Cole is going to, uh, no, excuse me, Professor Noel, not Cole, Professor Noel, I apologize. Uh, Professor Noel, though, is not, uh, he's going to take you down a rabbit trail and at the end of the day, he's basically going to assert that it was not the Pharisees who are predominantly the Orthodox rabbis of today, but rather it was the Sadducees uh, that actually were in control of the Sanhedrin, and they were the ones that sentenced him to death. And as he brings out in this uh, article, in his interview here, uh, they have disappeared from the pages of history. Uh, now, he asserts, too, that the Pharisees were far more in tune with the way that Yeshua believed. They believed in the coming of a Messiah. They had the Messianic visions. Uh, of, of the Messiah at that time, and uh, the Sadducees did not. They believed in the resurrection of the dead. So these are the two things that he cites that uh, he believes that really made a profound impact. I want to share some of the things here with you, and then we're going to talk about them. And I've highlighted most of the uh, pages on the article here. And an affable professor, cap on his head and white beard covering much of his face, has found the formula to end a centuries-old controversy. If he's right, history books will require rewriting, and sermons in churches around the world will have to be rethought. Uh, Israel Cole, excuse me, Israel Noel, tells me when we met in his office at the Shalom Hartum Institute in Jerusalem, German, uh, the German colony neighborhood. Bible scholar Noel 67 specializes in finding unconventional explanations for faithful issues and has no uh, uh, compunctions about angering his colleagues along the way. Earlier, studies by the religious observant holder of the uh, Yehazekel uh, Kaufman Chairman and Bible at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem have sparked a furious debate uh, transcending the confines of academia. This time the subject is more highly charged than ever, the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. And uh, I can tell you right now though, Professor Noll has probably found a, a, a lot of favoritism uh, with the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church has already uh, gone into repentance, especially after the Mekodeshit that the Vatican sponsored and of course the Nostra Aetate signed 50 years ago and of course reaffirmed on its anniversary here a few years back. 
uh, that indeed the Jews of today are not responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. And, and I could probably attest to the same. I, you know, I, how can you expect to hold the children of the Jews of 2,000 years ago uh, responsible for the death of Jesus Christ? But then again, uh, as he will assert in this article here, it was not the Pharisees that were the bad guys. And yet, oddly enough, throughout the entire scripture of the canon of the New Testament there, it is the Pharisees that Jesus implicates as devils, serpents, vipers, uh, adders, uh, pretty much anything you can possibly say, the children of the devil, etc., etc., etc. He talks about the Sadducees, but nowhere near as much as he does the Pharisees. He goes on to say, in the Messiah controversy, who are the Jews waiting for? He dropped down, says, after a billion of Christians were taught over many centuries that the Jews were responsible for Jesus' death, Noel sets out to re-examine this convention. The notion that Jesus was put to death by the Jewish people is fundamentally wrong. The great majority of the Jewish people did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, but espouse a messianic outlook that was basically similar to his. Centuries of enmity between Christendom and the Jewish people, which was wrongfully accused of bearing the guilt for Jesus' crucifixion. Surely the time has come to re-examine the events in their historical, religious, and social context. All right, now, I would assert, as we know from a, from a uh, historical context, uh, and this is also shared with many Jewish scholars as well, there were, in the days of Jesus, there were uh, notably the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. The Essenes were to be uh, believed to be uh, uh, remnants of the uh, Zadokite priesthood, and had fled Jerusalem as a result of the Maccabees that had usurped the authority of the true priesthood and had put in the Hasmonean dynasty, which became known as the Pharisees. And, uh, and of course, in doing so, then we did have the different views. Now, the Qumran community, there is ample enough evidence that supports that they did believe in the coming of the Messiah. I have looked at multiple documents relating to this information. One of those documents here being uh, the, the end time return of Elijah and Moses at Qumran by John C. Poitier. Uh, uh, he writes with many different scholastic uh, uh, backings on his work here. Uh, the, the idea of the Messiah, or in this case, we have to say anointed, uh, because in, in the writings that we read here, there seems to be, at, at outset, three different Messiah figures. One, uh, uh, the Messiah of Aaron and of Israel, which by many scholastic opinions, that also is one and the same. Aaron and of Israel is one and the same because of the singularity of the verb that is being used in, in the context of the uh, Qumran scrolls there. Uh, they do later also seem to implicate in the Qumran scrolls that they believe that it would be Elijah and Moses uh, that would actually uh, be considered. Moses being that he would actually be a return of playing himself the pro or playing the messiah figure of the prophet that uh that would be raised up like and unto him uh as it states there it's one of the reasons why they believe this and of course there was that that prince the messiah uh like daniel wrote about that is talked about quite extensively in the qumran scrolls i happen to have just just hundreds of the uh, of the uh, copies of the fragments that I'm able to study this with myself. Uh, and in fact, in doing so, I actually ran across one fragment. It's called 11Q14. Uh, and 11Q14 is, is one of the fragments that's been hotly contested. And uh, it's also, to me, uh, it, it would kind of even refute a lot of what uh, um, uh, Professor Knoll has to say here in his own arguments here. Uh, because the fragment here uh, purports that that uh, root of David would actually be killed. Uh, and I'm going to actually share that with you. I think I have actually made a copy of that for the screen here. Let me just double check and see. This is actually from one of the textual arguments over this. And yes, this is one of the ones right here. Uh, where it shows you the actual rendition in Hebrew of the fragments themselves. I have it highlighted there for you, both line 11 and line 12, 
uh, where you can read right there where it speaks about, well, it, start, it starts up here from, from uh, line 10. Uh, and it talks about the prophet Isaiah said, and it's quoting from Isaiah chapter 10, verse 34, and they shall cut the most massive uh, of the forest with iron, and Lebanon with its magnificence will fall. A shoot will emerge from the stump of Jesse. Now there is a blank in the, uh, the fragment there, and it goes on to say, the bud of David, and they will go into battle with, another blank in the fragment there, and the prince of the congregation will kill him, the bud of David. And that took me for a double take. I, had not, I did not realize, I think it was back in 1992, this debate first came to the public eye. I think it's Time Magazine that published this, uh, because there is conflicting views on how to translate it. Now, I looked at it in the Hebrew language as well, as I have it right here on the screen for you, and I do agree with the translator that translated uh, this particular way, and I believe that that, I believe it was uh, uh, Garcia Martinez that actually gave that particular translation, uh, as it states in here, the vertical ruling line identical to that in, order, in, in other fragments shows it should be placed at the bottom left of the column, since most preserved parts of the manuscript belong to fragment 1 in columns uh, 1 and 2, placement in one, uh, 1 is more likely than another column. The editors reconstruct Tzemach uh, David is what it says there in Hebrew, in the end of line 7, show that the text of 4Q285 easily fits in lines of 10 and 15 on this column and reconstruct these lines as follows, underlining the indicates of text extended in there in the 4Q285. Now, that's probably as complicated as it can possibly get for you, but basically what they're saying here is if you take the fragment, a 4Q285, and you tra take this fragment right here that I've actually got in front of my face here, 11Q14, and you superimpose them upon each other, they will fall in the exact right position, which lets them know that Semach David, the, the, the righteous branch of David, is the actual word that should be used there. The, the argument goes, though, whether or not uh, the word Semach is actually that way because you can't quite see the Chet in this case here. But what's even more concerning to me is if you look in this same, uh, same uh, book here that I'm looking at right now, the end time, uh, uh, jsstore.org, uh, written by John C. Uh, Poitier, you also have, when he does the conclusion of this argument here, uh, dealing with this fragment, LQ14, it states right here, that and uh, the 4QM manuscript is too complicated to simply call these manuscripts copies of the same composition. The differences between the 4QM manuscripts as well as the composite nature of 1QM as shown by Davies' analysis rather that indicate that there were different compositions or editions dealing with the eschatological war which were related to one another. 4Q285 and 11Q14 might be copies of one of those editions or may represent a related composition. The given dis, uh, the designation Sefer ha, uh, ha Milhama intends to leave the possibilities open not to commit the reader to any particular view. Basically, in other words, there are a lot of Jewish scholars that do not want to accept the fact uh, that the righteous branch of David, which is clearly uh, both by Jew Jews and Christians alike, is to be a, uh, a messianic prophecy. Uh, it, is the, it is the son of David, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the son of David that would come, which is the Mashiach, and therefore to see that that Mashiach would die does not go in line with a lot of their thinking. This was something that the Pharisees uh, never believed as well, and to this day, their ancestors, the Orthodox community today, still do not believe that uh, the Messiah was to die. He was to be a Messiah that would uh, that would bring about uh, complete deliverance of the Jews from the Roman authorities. Well, that, of course, even Jesus himself was able to prophesy when he read Isaiah 61, verse 1, half of verse 2, which there were no verses back in the, in, in the days of the Qumran scrolls. It was just the scroll was laid out there and you would read. But he never reads on to where it brings about the judgment, where he comes down and brings and just wipes off the map all these evil ones. Why? 
Yeshua closes up the, the scroll and he says, this day this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, uh, he knew that he was only fulfilling part of that scroll. And you can't say that there's not going to be, the Messiah would not be cut off because Daniel clearly shows that the Messiah would be cut off. So that runs into another problem. So he goes on to say, the notion that Jesus was put to death by the Jewish people is fundamentally wrong. The great majority of the Jewish people did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, but espoused a messianic outlook that was basically similar to his. Goes on to say, he says, adding that today, after centuries of enmity between Christendom and the Jewish people, which was wrongfully accused of bearing uh, the guilt of Jesus' crucifixion, surely the time has come to re-examine the events in their historical, religious, and social context. We move down a little further. The Torah presents an anti-messianic stance, according to which the gulf between the divine and the human cannot be bridged. This approach rules out the possibility that a flesh and blood king will achieve a quasi-divine status and supports a clear separation between the two realms. According to God, cannot possibly have begotten a son, and eternal life cannot be attributed to a king or messiah. Now, of course, the article, the, 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 uh, the professor, Noel, does admit that he does find other passages, especially in the Psalms, etc., that, on the other hand, some prophetic books, some of the individual Psalms do express a messianic approach and attribute divine qualities to the king, whoever he may be, a portrait of uh, him and the Son of God as sitting next to God in heaven and possessing divine names. Even in the Qumran scrolls, where we have uh, writings of Daniel that are attributed to Dan Daniel as well, that are not in our can canon, Daniel also speaks of a son of God-like figure, uh, or son of the Most High as well. Not just the Psalms of David that refer to, this, uh, to the Messiah as being more of a human figure on the earth, right? So anyway, as we drop down further to look at some more things that he talks about when it comes to Yeshua, he says here that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, as I quoted earlier. He has anointed me and tells the worshiper, This day the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. According to Null and his deeds, Jesus continued the Messianic biblical tradition and supported his words with references from the Hebrew Bible about the image of the Messiah. Well, sure he did. But the thing is, as I pointed out already, though, Yeshua knew that only a certain part of that passage was going to be fulfilled. And clearly it shows, as Daniel points out, that that uh, that anointed prince that would come would be cut off, not for himself, but for the sake of the people. So there's a lot of things that Mr. Noel is leaving out that a lot of people would just never realize. He goes on to write, Many among the Jewish people hoped he would prove himself to be the Messiah. He would redeem the people and restore its freedom. He enjoyed great public uh, sympathy. The people were fond of him, cheered him on, and supported and protected him. Now, he makes that claim because he talks about, as he's going to say here, whereas the disciples who followed the clung to the prevailing belief and triumphant warrior Messiah and expecting him to deliver the people from Roman rule, Jesus saw himself as a suffering, nonviolent, poor, and weak Messiah. <clears throat> now, I'm going, to, I'm going to address this issue here in a minute, what I, was, what I was saying to you, but let me just continue on. It follows that if the Messiah is a quasi-divine figure, it was impossible for him to suffer, as Jesus claimed. However, Noel looked for and found evidence of divine suffering of other sources and explains that the portrait of divinity suffering with his people appeared in Jewish tradition before the birth of Christianity. And this is true. As we can see right here, not only does it say in fragment 11Q14 that the prince of the congregation will kill him, the bud of David that is, but it also speaks in a fragmentary way with wounds, and the high priest will command. What are the wounds? Well, we know that he would be wounded in the house of his friends, according to the psalmist David, uh, writing about, uh, obviously, the Messiah, as Christians would believe, right? So he goes on down further, and I'm trying to get to the part where he talks about the Pharisees. But anyway, Jesus judges, uh, Jesus judges, null emphasizes, did not faithfully represent the feelings of the people. According to all sources, the Sadducees who sentenced him to death represented only a minority of the Jewish people. The majority of Jews in Jesus' time actually supported the Pharisees, who agreed with Jesus that the Messiah would bear a quasi-divine status, he notes. Oh! That one just blew me away, right? Let, let's look this up real quick, though. All right? Let me just see if I can do it, put, put it like this. Fear synagogue. Let me see. If i got to find this. This is really difficult to do here. Let me see. I may have spelt the word synagogue wrong. Okay. All right. 
put out. Okay, yeah, here we go. John 12, uh, let me, let's see. Yeah, we have it in John chapter 9, 22, and also John uh, um, uh, 12, 42. So let me just pull that up real quick for you. Because, you know, he talks about how that, oh, the majority of the people were all on, on the Pharisee sides, and they were the ones that were standing up for, for Yeshua. Well, that is completely wrong. Completely wrong, right? And and I hate to say this to Mr. Noel, but I, I appreciate the fact in his article he talks about if he's proven wrong, he will consider, he will go and research these things. Now I'm just kind of running through this really quickly with you guys, and this is not giving it the due justice that it deserves to really uh, refute uh, Professor Noel and, and what I believe is his com complete uh, error on this. But I also, because he does mention in the article that's written about him there that there is no evidence uh, that supports that uh, the Pharisees had anything to do with his death. I got it right here, don't worry. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess to him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Whoa! 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 For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Oh, wow, what do you know? Because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Well, you know, Professor Noel, uh, I hate to disappoint you, but that is just about as slap in the face as you possibly can when you said here, the majority of Jews in Jesus' time actually supported the Pharisees who agreed with Jesus that Messiah would bear a quasi-divine status, he notes. And that's actually contrary to what he says earlier in the article that Yeshua believe that he was a weak messiah as he describes it there but no on the other hand we find out that uh, Jesus speaks about that they were afraid that the Pharisees would throw him out of the synagogues he goes on to say like Jesus and his disciples most of the people believed in the resurrection of the dead Pharisees did believe in the resurrection of the dead that is true and the advent of the Messiah bearing divine qualities, and that is true as well. It is reasonable to assume that if Jesus had been judged by Pharisees, he would have been acquitted. Professor Knoll says, it was not the Jewish people who tried him, but the leadership of the minority group. And as he puts it, the Sadducees. That's completely false, Professor Knoll. And you did make a comment in your research there that there was no proof to that. To the contrary, there is proof. In the Hebrew Matthew, a document that goes back many centuries, and there are fragments of the Hebrew Matthew. Uh, I think there's a total of 18 different fragments of the Hebrew Matthew, uh, but I'm using, on this case here, uh, George Howard's uh, Hebrew Matthew here uh, on there, and I can show you both in Hebrew and in English as well. But if we go to verse 57, uh, you say that it was the Sadducees that were in control and that convicted uh, Yeshua. It says, verse, uh, we'll start with verse 56. Surely all this was done because the writings of the prophets were being fulfilled. Then all his disciples left him and fled. They led Jesus to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. Then all the scribes and Pharisees were gathered together. What do you know? Let me just show you this in Hebrew so you don't make that mistake there. All right, here you go, right there. The scribes and the Pharisees. Upashim. Okay, so we find in the Hebrew Matthew that they are clearly the Pharisees. All right, doesn't allow me to highlight that one in green, but hopefully you can see that right there, Professor Null. And it doesn't do it just once, it does it on multiple occasions here. I'm going to read a little bit more to you, but now that you know that the word Pharisees is in there, and by the way, if you were to look at this in the Christian Bible, you will not see the Pharisees word there. You will actually see now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. So therefore, we don't know if it's Sadducees or Pharisees. You're only trying to say this based on what you believe is, is historically correct. Well, the Hebrew Matthew uh, totally contradicts what you just said there. Peter was following him at a distance, verse 58, unto the house of the high priest. He entered the house and sat near the craftsmen until he should see the end. The chief priests and the Pharisees wished to find false witnesses against Jesus in order to put him to death. Who wanted to put him to death? The Pharisees. What do you know? You know, it was also said by Jesus, too, when, you know, 
he was talking about the Pharisees, you know, when they make that famous comment, says, uh, uh, let me just pull it up just in case Professor Noel actually gets to watch this video here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is where the famous statement is, you know, if we'd have been in the days, we would not have killed the prophets. Um... Yeah, Matthew 23, 31, and I'm going to read that one from the Hebrew Matthew as well, because that is a very powerful statement in itself there, just to read that one, 23, 31, all right, so let's just go to it here, I believe that's where it was, okay, yes, uh, back up here to verse 27, woe to you sages and Pharisees, hypocrites, who are like whited sepulchers which appear on the outside to be beautiful to men, on the inside are full of bones of the dead and, and the filthy. Uh, thus you appear on the outside to be righteous to men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you hypocrites, Pharisees, and sages, because you build the tombs of the prophets and glorify the monuments of the righteous. You say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have permitted them to put the prophets to death. And this you bear witness against yourselves, that you are the sons of those who killed the prophets. You behave according to the deeds of your fathers. Serpents, seed of vipers, who will you, how, excuse me, how will you escape the judgment of Gehenna if you do not turn in repentance? At that time Jesus said to the crowds of Jews, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets, sages, and scribes. Some of them you will kill, some of them you will afflict in your synagogues, and you will pursue them from city to city. All right? So the Pharisees clearly hated Jesus because he condemned them on a regular basis. And if he said there, you know, basically there, where is it again? Um, you have, uh, let's see. If we had been in the days of our, we would not have permitted them to, to, to put the prophets to death. If, in this, you bear witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who killed the prophets. It's no different. And today, the Orthodox community say that they are the descendants of the Pharisees. So they got a long history. In fact, Jesus even goes so far as to say to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. So... We're running into a lot of problems, and when we look at the article here that was written, uh, in, in, uh, and this was actually on Haaretz.com, it's published just recently here, uh, but he goes into a lot of other things in here. Is it safe to assume that the sages, and not, uh, notably Rabbi Akiva, would not have sentenced Jesus to death for his messianic views, which were not so far from their own approach? Yet the tragic circumstances of history had Jesus living during the period of which the Sadducees controlled the temple and became his judges. Well, as we just showed, that was completely false. And as far as Rabbi Akiva, all you have to do is take a look at the Talmud and see all their thoughts about Jesus to kind of get a good idea of exactly how they looked at Jesus as well. Not in a very a very good light. In fact, in, in many places they talk about that he is an excriminant and that he is in hell burning right now. Uh, they, they considered his people the zealots and they also blamed uh, the destruction of the city uh, of Jerusalem and the temple on Jesus and his followers. They called him violent. In fact, it was uh, Memonides that actually states that uh, uh, the prophecy over in uh, Daniel 11, the violent among your people, they shall try to establish a vision, but they shall stumble, uh, uh, applies that to Yeshua, to Jesus Christ and his followers. When in reality, Jesus was not violent, even as Professor Noel actually mentions in his own article. He was more of a passive person, nonviolent. He calls him weak. He was not weak. If he not gave his life and died the way he did, then his, his own, this, the very life that was living in him could have never come back upon the people. He truly was that prophet. As the scripture says, he was that prophet that God said to Moses that he would raise up like unto him. He became the rock itself that Moses wrote about because God said there when the children of Israel, they said, let not God, let not Yehovah speak lest we die. So God had to take and put his voice in a man and he had to put his voice inside of that man. And God even said that when he raises up a prophet like him unto, unto Moses, he said, you are to hear everything he says. And if you don't hear what he says, you will be cut off from the people. 
And of course, he had to be smitten. If he wasn't smitten, Professor Null, then there would have been no life. There would have been no water that could have come from the rock. And it took the elders of Israel to actually condemn him to death as it was in the times of the wilderness journey when Moses went out there and God said to him, take the elders of Israel, go out there and smite the rock, not 38 years later, the first time that is, then it bring forth its waters. So the elders of Israel had to again smite the rock. And so therefore, when we look at the Qumran scrolls here, it is more correct to say the prince of the congregation will kill the bud of David or the Tzemach of David, the branch of David. Why? Because if he did not do that, then the water could have not come forth. The water from his side would have never come forth, showing that he was indeed that rock that was smitten in the wilderness. And then the life that he had breathed upon Adam in the garden back uh, all these thousands of years ago, could have never been fulfilled when he breathed upon his apostles and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. We could have never seen Zechariah 8, the prophecy there, that they would take the hold of the skirt of a Jewish man, or the wing, kanaf, uh, uh, the kanaf of a uh, ish Yehudi. All right? None of this could have ever been fulfilled. So, Professor Noel, I challenge you on what you're saying here. The basic agreement exists between the Messianic concepts of Jesus and the historic Jewish concept. No, that's false. The hatred of the Jewish people harbored by Christian people is based primarily on the belief in the Jews responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. I would say this, in, re in, in regards to this statement right here by Professor Noel. Listen, Christian friends, we know that what happened to our Lord is a bitter part for the believers of Yeshua. But always remember, had it not happened, had the rock not been smitten by the elders of Israel, we would have died of thirst. It's the same thing for the, for, the, for the Israelites in the wilderness journey. Had the rock not been smitten, they would have died of thirst. Had Christ not been smitten and killed, there would be no latter rain to be poured out upon the people. There would be no former rain. And in fact, the smiting of the rock in the wilderness journey is a type of the former rain, and the latter rain was when he was actually struck here on Calvary. So it had to happen. He goes on to say, yes, there was a trial, but those who judged Jesus were a minority group who disappeared from the Jewish map. No, they didn't. They're still here today. And clearly, as the evidence shows in the Hebrew Matthew, they are definitely here today. All right, he goes into the Vatican Council. I'll try to go into this a little bit later, but I wanted to kind of address, uh, address the basic uh, tenets of this. And also, uh, listen, friends, we've got to get our minds on Jesus Christ. I know there's a lot of political upheaval in our nation, around the world. There's all kinds of things that are going on. But if we don't get our focus back on Christ... We're going to be taken away by a bunch of lies. All right? I love you guys. And I will say this. The opposition I have had because of the things that I said recently when I was listening to Trump give uh, uh, Biden and his son uh, grief over what happened in the Ukraine. I know a lot about what happened in Ukraine. I've shared a lot of that with you guys already. But I also know that and as I said before, I don't doubt a single bit that the president is wrong in that. I believe he's correct in that. You know, Biden's son probably did get millions in it. Well, as RT pointed out the other day, President Trump got, what, 1.5 million for what, what, what was it that he did that RT pointed out? Uh, listen, you have no idea the sinister things that go on by politicians, even long before they get into office. They didn't become billionaires uh, because they were good, saintly Christians trying to serve God. Now, I know there's a lot of wealthy Christian ministers out there that have their 501c mega churches and their jet planes and everything because they milk the people for everything they possibly have. But let me see some of you pastors, and I challenge you, I challenge you pastors out there that are willing to take a stand, like what we stand here, stand for truth. Take the way with the despised few, and we'll see just how wealthy you stay. And that's one of the reasons why these pastors won't do it. But they will tickle your ears, have no fear. They will tickle your ears, and they will sing the praises of politicians, including Netanyahu and Trump and all the rest. And yet, 
sign abortion bills and, you know, I'm not talking about America, I'm talking about Netanyahu. Uh, blow up people's children and call this for what? Advancing democracy? Oh, and by the way, that reminds me. You know how Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself? And we know, because he gives a parable about the, about the Samaritan, and he asked the, the, the Jewish man, he said, then who was, who was the true neighbor? Because, you know, the Pharisees went past the guy and didn't have anything to do with him. But the Samaritan cared for the guy and took care of his wounds and stuff like that. And of course, the guy says it was the Samaritan. And most Orthodox Jews will tell you, though, that your neighbor is another Jew or another Israelite. It is not the Gentiles, because the Gentiles, by the way, are just animals. We're, the Gentile is considered to have a soul lower than, just as, the same as an animal, no different. If you haven't listened to some of my wife's uh, uh, dissertations on these things, exposing the Talmudic beliefs and things like that, and even rabbis speaking about it on a regular basis, you really need to listen. Go to Patreon, check out the things that are being said so you can get yourself educated on these things. But I found in the Qumran scrolls, of all places, I found in the Qumran scrolls where the issue of your neighbor and who your neighbor is. And, and in the Qumran scrolls, and I can't remember if it was one of the Psalms or which one it was, though, but, the, but, the, but your neighbor were the Gentile neighbors. He actually refers to them as your neighbor and says that, I forget exactly the way it was worded, I'll have to pull it up to share it with you later. Uh, but we are not, oh, as oppressed, you are not to oppress your neighbors. And he shows that it was the Gentiles. Whoa, my Jewish brethren. Take the word of God and believe it. It'll do you a lot of good. And I love you. You're my people. I am Jewish. I'm Jewish by both my parents. You don't think I don't love you? I wouldn't stand here and tell you the truth the way I do if I didn't love you. I say that from the depth of my heart. And I realize not everybody out there. They talking about reptile. I heard somebody saying to me, they tell me, they talking about reptilians coming out of the swamp or something like that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Let me tell you something. The reptilians, there's many reptilians that wear preacher suits. They wear rabbinical suits and not all so don't make that mistake Jesus said what did he say about the parable the enemy had went out there while 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 the while the children all slept and the enemy went there and he plant he planted in seeds as well that were tares and they came up they went to the master and said Lord didn't you plant wheat in your field and how did these tares come up and the Lord of the harvest said, my enemy has done this. That's what Satan did. He got those Le Le Levites, those priests, and he got them all mixed up in the ungodliness. Just like it was when Aaron made the golden calf. No different. And according to Ezra, we find out they mingled the seed. They brought in the reptilians in. Why do you think Jesus called them what they were? He said to them, basically he's just saying, you're reptiles, you're reptilians. You want to find out where the reptilians are, that's where they are. But, now the thing is, we don't know who's who. And that's why you should never condemn a person just because they're Orthodox Jewish. We don't know which one's which. I was Jewish as well. All right? Nehemia Gordon. I love that man. That's a, that's a real Jewish man right there that loves God. He's a Karite Jew. And I appreciate him tremendously. A Karite is not a reptilian either. And there's many that are part of the Orthodox community that didn't get tangled up in there. But we know that Scripture said it was the chief leaders among the priests that got involved in this mess. The chief rulers. And they've come down through there. But I, doubt, I don't doubt a bit in the world that there are some real good Orthodox Jews that if they could only hear, they would believe. We do know those Karaites are the ones that are in partly blind. 
I'm Steve Benin, and you're watching Israeli News Live. Thank you for watching. Please support the broadcast. We're not very popular. Many, many people want to support what we do. But if you do believe the truth and you want to know the truth, stand for what the truth is. You can do so. Our address here on the bottom of your screen, as well as it will be in the description below. Our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. God bless you.